just going to check a couple of things here before we get started. Great. And Li Ling, how are we doing on number of people here at this current moment? Um, I, oh, 37 participants. Okay, great. So, so I'd we'll say wait. let's, um, you know, let's like wait to get it to 50. Okay. Or a couple more minutes or something. Mm-hmm. Great. So we're up to 43. Great. Well, I might just in cognizant of time, I'll wait one more minute and then we'll start getting it. We'll start moving forward. How does that sound to everybody? Sounds good to me. Great. Yeah, they're coming in now. Okay, great. Well, I think I'm going to start this. Can everyone hear me all right? Gary Leland, can you hear me all right? Yes, fine. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Nick. Um, I hope you're all having a good day today. And if you're in um, Hi, Ross. <laughs> the Burlington, Vermont area, you're enjoying the, the nice sun we have before we have a couple rainy days. My name's Ethan Bellavance. I'm a senior energy consultant here at Efficiency Vermont. Uh, and myself and Gary Dusheim are going to be presenting today on um, leak tight HVACR installations. Uh, I'm going to kind of frame out high level why Efficiency Vermont is playing in this space. And Gary, um, who has the technical experience on this, is going to dive into the nitty gritty on how to really um, have a best in class HVAC um, and air source heat pump installation. Before I, want to, before I get started, I just want to note that this is a training that's put on by Efficiency Vermont's Efficiency Excellence Network. Um, that's a network of uh, contractors and, and trades and trades throughout the state of Vermont that uh, Efficiency Vermont supports and promotes. And this is one of uh, the trainings that um, you're able to get access to when you are an Efficiency Excellence Network. Um, and that's, uh, you know, just an exciting thing to, to talk about. So let's dive into it on HVACR installation. Before we get into the the nitty gritty, I want to start with some high level stuff. And a lot of us here use refrigerants on a regular basis, but I figured it makes sense to quickly define what they are. So what are refrigerants? Refrigerants really are working fluids that can easily be manipulated with via pressure changes to change between a liquid and a gas phase. And that phase conversion between liquid and ga gas is how we're able to move 90 plus percent of the heat in a refrigeration system. And refrigerants are really effective at moving heat. That's why as a society, we're looking more and more towards refrigerant based systems to um, efficiently heat and cool our building stocks. Now, why is Efficiency Vermont in the HVAC best in class installations space? And the reason really is that the majority of the refrigerants that we use today are HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. And those HFCs are short-lived climate pollutants. Depends on which hydrofluorocarbon or HFC we are talking about, but their global warming potential is around, the average global warming potential of HFCs is between two and 4,000. And what that means is that on a molecule to molecule basis, 
uh, HFC can trap two to 4,000 times more heat in our atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So it's a pretty potent greenhouse gas. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change specifically has called out HFCs and their needs to be reduced by 70 to 80% by 2050. I also wanna talk about the fact that refrigerants are responsible for a lot of the miracles of our modern life. You know, mm. beer, which is amazing, ice cream, which is great for the children. Um, but it's also, it's also now required for the survival of our species as we know it. Without refrigeration and refrigerants, we don't really have a food system in a global cold chain. Without refrigerants and refrigeration, we don't have a vaccine cold chain. So while it's important for us to make sure that we're limiting the impacts of refrigerants on our climate, we here at Efficiency Vermont are fully cognizant that refrigerants are critical and refrigeration is critical to life on this planet as we know it. And we wanna make sure that these refrigerants and refrigeration systems are running as environmentally and energy efficiently as possible. So let's just quickly high, high level, like where are refrigerants even found in our homes? We see them all over the place in our air conditioners, in our refrigerators, and specifically what we're talking about today is in our air to air heat pumps. This is just a slide that I have to include on a lot of my tra uh, trainings because I love the, just the history of where we've come from and where we're going on refrigerants. So direct vapor compression refrigeration really started back in the 1800s. And we started with natural refrigerants, as interesting as it sounds. Um, you know, ether, there was some issues with using that. Compressing ether makes some, some things go boom. Carbon dioxide, ammonia, sulfur dioxide, not a great refrigerant to breathe in. So as you can tell, with the first generation of refrigerants, we had some issues with them, high pressures and significant safety concerns. As history has progressed and we've moved from the 1830s to the 1930s, we started using more hydrocarbons, ammonia, water, but there are challenges and drawbacks with those as well. And it really started in that World War II era, era when CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, um, were invented, that the broad applicability of refrigeration expanded. CFCs are amazing refrigerants. They're low pressure, they're non-toxic, they're non-flammable. The problem is that they left the pipe and they had significant global warming and ozone depletion potential. And so the Montreal Protocol, which was actually signed on my birthday, <laughs> interesting coincidence, um, was signed September 16th, 1987. And that really was the global phase down of CFCs, which then moved into the global phase out of CFCs because uh, we were getting a hole in our ozone layer and that was a problem. We really shifted from CFCs over to HFCs, hydrofluorocarbon. Uh, we, knew, we knew this going into it, that we were making a trade for ozone depletion potential to global warming potential, but we needed to solve our, global, our ozone. So we really have shifted the industry over to HFCs. And now we started about a decade ago, I would say in this you know, fourth generation um, marker where there's a lot of different refrigerants out there moving to lower GWP, hydrofluorocarbons, natural refrigerants are making a strong playback specifically in the low and medium temp refrigeration spaces and grocery store spaces. Um, hydrocarbons are making a significant playback in residential refrigerators and uh, in the self-contained spaces. And then HVAC, the people are dabbling with lower GWP HFCs and HFO blends even. So it's not just me who's talking about the global phase down of HFCs, uh, the Montreal Protocol um, and the Kigali Amendment on the Montreal Protocol um, is really the global agreement of phasing down HFCs by 85% by 2045. Uh, while the United States has not ratified the Kigali Agreement, we have passed legislation that essentially makes us follow this um, non-A5 early starter, that red line right here. So as you can see, we've already started our HFC phase down. Um, and that first jump was really with automobiles. If you buy a new automobile, 
the refrigerant in that air conditioning system is likely going to be a hydrofluoro olefin or an HFO, very low GWP. Now, bringing it back to Efficiency Vermont's refrigerant management strategy, we've really taken a four-pronged approach. Um, the first approach, and this is really to make sure that we're being both pragmatic and ambitious, the first approach is proactive leak repair. We have a lot of existing refrigeration systems out there today. We wanna make sure that the refrigerants stay in the pipe. There really isn't a problem with refrigerants if they stay in the pipe. So let's work hard to do that. And we um, support that through our um, enhanced uh, leak repair uh, incentive program. We also are working on leak tight installations. And this is our first salvo on trainings on how to do best in class. Um, air-to-air -air heat pump uh, leak tight installations. We also support reducing char system charges, mainly moving towards chiller-based systems, and also installing natural refrigerant systems when it's applicable. So just on the refrigerant management scale and how efficiency Vermont plays, you know, we work with a large, we work with a lot of different customers on refrigerant sizes. So we've got our grocery stores, um, that we work and you know an average charge for a grocery store may be around 3,000 pounds and we're working with them to make sure that that those refrigerants stay in the pipe and shift to naturals whenever possible but there's really only about 100 grocery stores that have this kind of charge size in our state we work with convenience stores with have, which may have a refrigerant charge of around 300 pounds if they're heated and cool with vrf as well and we've got about a thousand of those in the state and the home size and the small refrigerant charge with these air-to-air -air heat pumps, which is the focus of our presentation today, um, you know, smaller refrigerant charges, you know, three to 10 pounds, depending on what kind of systems we're talking about. But I've heard that the market potential for air-to-air -air heat pumps in Vermont can be upwards of four to 500,000 units. So while these air-to-air -air heat pumps might not leak a ton, um, you know, we're looking at leakage rates in that three to 5%. Um, there's a lot of them out there. And if we can cut that down even more, there's a significant impact on both the environment and energy efficiency long-term. So we've established, um, you know, kind of our perspective on what best-in-class leak tight installation practices look like. And it's pretty simple. Uh, we want the and also want to acknowledge the fact that all of this is predicated on appropriate tools being used. And this is where Gary is going to just shine and really give us a lot of knowledge on these tools. But we want to see pressurization tests around that 350 PSIG mark. Um, and we don't want to see pressure loss on that in a 10 to 15 minute period. We also want that hooked up with the digital gauge, not a mechanical one. And on the vacuum side, when, whenever possible, we wanna pull a vacuum into that 200 to 300 micron range on the far side of the system, not at the vacuum pump. Um, and we're looking for a maximum decay to 500 microns within 10 minutes. And we're gonna talk about how this can happen um, actually faster than with potentially standard um, install techniques being used today. And just wanna reiterate that all of these techniques really are requiring um, the use of proper equipment and tools. And so with that, um, yeah, so Lewis, before I, I want, I see your question here, I'm gonna let Gary move into which type of gauges you wanna see during pressure testing, cause he's got all of that. And so great, I'm just gonna shift over. Um, I'm gonna let Gary, you speak, but before I do, I just wanna give Gary a quick little intro um, just to show how credible he actually is. Sorry for that um, freak out on the slides. So Gary Ducharme brings over 36 years of HVAC refrigeration technical skills, product knowledge and teaching to us today. He began um, his HVAC training, HVAC and refrigeration training as a mechanic for the Grand Union Company when that was still around, um, doing supermarket refrigeration in 1985. He worked as a top mechanic for Simmons Precision for 14 years, where he specialized in inventory sales, um, inventory research and training. He was the president and owner of Air Doctor for 14 years, working part-time doing HVACR installations and repairs. And in 2000, he started working at Blodgett Supply in Wilston, Vermont, where he retired from in, in 2018 as their HVACR regional sales manager. Here, 
He specialized in inventory research, sales, and training for the seven stores. Gary always is researching the latest HVACR products, and we really found that. And that's really what, uh, why we're so excited to bring him here today. He knows a lot of this equipment. And while working for Blodgett, he started his own HVAC refrigeration training school um, for <clears throat> teaching HVACR to plumbing, heating, electrical, and refrigeration contracts, contact, contractors. In retirement, Gary has consulted with various businesses, if you can even call this retirement, Gary, right? You're still, yeah. still working on a regular basis. Every day. Um, every day. And he's consulting and teaching refrigeration courses <clears throat> to the local um, union, uh, pipe fitters union. So with that, Gary, um, take it away. Let me know if you would like me to, um, when you'd like me to advance your slides, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Gary, if I could just interrupt for a moment, I just want to encourage folks to use the chat if you want to um, pose a question. Um, if it's a really burning question for that moment in the presentation, we can interrupt and address it. Otherwise, we'll collect the questions to the end and address them during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Mary. Thanks, Gary. Okay, good morning. Um, thank you all for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. So let's talk about what we can possibly do to streamline our install and our service procedures. That's what I want to talk about today. Initially, I want to talk about what, what we can do um, without spending a lot of money now with the equipment that we have and maybe the addition of just a few tools that are very reasonably priced. Um, so having a free app, for example, investing in a good digital micron gauge and having an app that it reports to can save and share information with you and your customers. Some of these apps will actually invoice your customer while you're on the job. A lot of time-saving apps are out there. Um, when we're installing a micron gauge, let me just say this now, um, because it's very important that we get a proper micron reading and our system is properly evacuated. The only way we can do that is having our micron gauge farthest away from the micron uh, vacuum pump as we can get. And the reason for that is we may have um, a 500 micron reading at the vacuum pump, but further on the other side of the system, our reading could be in the thousands of microns. Uh, this has been something that uh, uh, I've learned about just in the past couple of years. I've always had my micron uh, gauge right next to the pump. And uh, so I, I had to learn myself. It's, it's very easy to, um, to, to do something time tried and true that isn't right. And one of the things we need to do is look at some of the things that we can, that we can learn uh, from some of the uh, teachers that are out there now. The micron level reached at uh, uh, 350 microns at the pump like I say, can be not represent, represented at the end of the unit. Uh, so wherever possible, we want to move that micron gauge to the farthest part of the unit away from the pump. Next slide, please. So let's talk about core removal tools and talk about uh, cores in general. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with what a Schrader core is, and it does a great service to us because it allows, it keeps refrigerant in the pipe next to the valves, in the valves that we're working on. However, when we want to work on a system, we really need to remove those cores to get a better flow. They restrict the flow greatly. So we have a core removal tool, and depending on the size of the fitting, um, when we come into the air-to-air -air heat pumps, we went up to a 5 16th fitting for a reason. Uh, number one, it was not R22 anymore, it was R410A, and the manufacturers wanted some kind of an indication to the technician that, hey, something's different here. Um, I can only tell you that as a wholesaler, I sold in the early days uh, ductless split systems and had many calls coming not long after from the technician saying, my hoses don't fit on this. So there was a reason for that. So we, we started the education process right there. The core removal tool actually can 
really increase the testing and evacuating charging times. Now they make it easy to replace a leaking trader core, which is something that uh, until these core tools came out, uh, we had to actually remove the refrigerant or pump down the system so that we could replace a valve core. Or sometimes we just capped it over and kept it nice and tight. So full flow through the uh, valve core, uh, the dedicated oversized evacuation hose. We're gonna talk about evacuation hoses. And you can see in the slide, uh, the true blue hose, which is a three quarter inch non-permeable hose made for evacuation. It can, it can change the evacuation time to minutes and not hours. Next slide, please. Great, on the tool maintenance slide. Um, the uh, one with the uh, the gaskets. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so replacing worn or damaged gaskets is critical. Uh, I don't know how many times I have students that I've talked to about this, and they they never have changed the gasket. Uh, the ho the holes may be old, may be used quite a bit. They just weren't thinking about changing the gasket. The gasket has not always been easy to change on a quarter inch holes, especially. Um, in, in, the, in days in the past, we had to take a knife or a screwdriver, stick it into the fitting, uh, pry it out, sometimes breaking it. Sometimes pieces of the fitting were going into the holes. Um, today, we have uh, the yellow jacket up in the top left here, the yellow jacket core, uh, gasket removal tool, which is fantastic. It's only been out a few years, but it actually is a, a great tool for taking a gasket out and reminding the service tech that he should be replacing gaskets. It's a tool that's in his belt. Uh, on one side, we have a real sharp uh, uh, edge. We can pluck the uh, gasket right out very easily. And on the other side, the other part of changing a gasket on a hose is getting it back in properly. So we were kind of pushing on the edges of the, of the gasket to get it back into the holes and sometimes unevenly and sometimes damaging the gasket at the same time. You can see on the left-hand side of that tool, there is a cylinder just the right size to push that gasket right back in and give it a good full uh, seat. Uh, valve, the uh, Schrader depressor valve right here on the top right is another tool that has come up a little ways in the, in the days from the days when we first saw them. You see this one is adjustable. Some, some uh, Schrader cores are deeper than others. Uh, sometimes we need something we can adjust and those, that's what that's for. Next slide, please. So separate, separate and maintain a set of hoses for evacuation only. That's really important because we have, we have when we do service work with a manifold set, we're using that manifold set um, and we're putting refrigerant through that and with refrigerant comes oil. So oil and refrigerant in those manifold hoses are not gonna give you a good time when you try to do an evacuation. You're gonna to have to work through that first before you even get into the system. It's easy to just set a separate set for just evacuation. They don't have to be an expensive set. Um, they, they don't have to be the largest hoses available right now. We can just have a, a standard manifold set for evacuation if we use a manifold set with evacuation. Today, what we're thinking, what, what, what we're doing instead of using a manifold set, because we have a lot of connections there that can leak, we're using a straight hose right into the vacuum pump. The newer vacuum pumps will have a manifold uh, set, will have a digital gauge that'll tell us what the manifold is gonna tell us anyway. Um, so uh, if, there's, if they're the smaller quarter inch hoses, it would be important to remove the core depressor we just talked about in the last slide to get, get even more maximum flow. Even though you're not depressing a Schrader core, you want to get that uh, depressor core out of there for full flow. And also digital gauges really give you the quickest indication of a leak during a nitrogen test. A burden two pressure gauge may take minutes to register a slight leak, where a digital gauge will, will register within the 10th of a pound 
of a leak very quickly. That's definitely a, a time saver. Next slide, please. So invest in a good digital micron gauge that reports to an app to save and share information. Um, having a free app <clears throat> will let you know when your system is ready for the decay test and let you know and so that you can perform other tasks while that's being that's going on. It'll also quickly, quickly document that evacuation so that you have a record for your customer and for your own business. Next slide, please. Now, at this point, a lot of us have heard of the term of the, of the product Nylog. Initially, when the ductless splits were coming out, manufacturers were recommending that in order to um, have a proper flare, we need to lubricate that flare and possibly the end of the flare uh, fitting that we're going on to with a little bit of polyester oil. Now, polyester oil is very expensive. Um, at the time when we were selling the early, uh, in the early 2000s, we were selling ductless splits at Blodgett Supply. We had customers that were buying a gallon of polyester oil because they wanted to uh, uh, comply with the installation procedures and put lubrication on that flare nut. Now a gallon of polyester oil comes in a metal container because it's extremely, extremely hygroscopic and very expensive. So they were spending a lot of money to lubricate that little flare nut until a great product named Nylog came out, which is actually elastic polyester oil. And it's a great product and I use it all the time and I suggest anybody using it, especially even on a flare cone. Your flare cone, while you're making that flare, is going to have a little bit of lubrication on it. And you're also gonna to wanna to check that flare cone to make sure there's no dings or, or, or problems with that before you even make your flare. You need to invest in a good 45 degree flaring tool, an eccentric tool that has a clutch. Some of these will have a clutch and they'll also have a guide that will tell you exactly how far you're gonna, you're gonna push that copper tubing in before you tighten. Next slide, please. All right, so maintain a good vacuum pump and keep the oil clean, that's paramount. It's very easy. Vacuum pump oil is not expensive. It comes in a plastic container. Um, and it is your best insurance about having a pump that's going to operate properly and save you time and money. Eventually, all, all the non-purities and the non-condensables and the water vapor and the air is going to go into that oil and contaminate it. Especially if you look in the oil sight glass, on your vacuum pump, if you see any bubbles or foaming, it's way past time to change that oil. I recommend changing that oil with every job. It's a simple procedure that can save you time and money. And if it's a burnout or something where you know you have water in your system, I would recommend multiple times while you're pulling that vacuum. Some of the newer pumps actually can run while you change the oil. Um, next slide, please. Nitrogen. Um, back in 84 and 85, when I started in this business, we didn't use nitrogen. I hate to tell you what we used for leak testing. Um, we didn't know. We didn't know that, there, that we had a problem with the ozone layer in the refrigerant. But since we have had nitrogen, um, the regulators have upgraded. Now you can have a regulator that you can test purge and braze with different, just different settings on the, on the regulator. Sweeping the system with nitrogen before uh, brazing or evacuation or leak testing is always a good idea. So what, what do I mean by sweeping the system? I mean, putting um, maybe 100 PSIG of pressure on one side of the system and then evacuating it on the other side just pushing that nitrogen through the system can remove condensables, can remove water vapor, and, and can help you in your, in your evacuation. Um, also, if, when you're testing with, a, with nitrogen, in your initial test, 
I would suggest you sweep before that initial nitrogen test. Sweep some of that moisture out if you can, because when you start building up pressure inside of a system with nitrogen, and you start going to 350 PSIG or higher, I know that some install manuals want you to go to 600, but 350, let's go with what, what, with what we're recommending at 350 PSIG. You're compressing that um, moisture water molecule inside of that system. And when you compress it to a point, uh, you, can, you can start having standing water come from that pressure, similar to uh, an air pump. Uh, an air compressor. That's why they leak water, because when, when the moisture in, in air is compressed tightly and quickly, it can release moisture. So that first initial nitrogen sweep is very important to get as much of that standing moisture or in the air out of that system before you pressurize. Hey, Gary. Yeah. Oh, okay, Liebling. Uh, not to, we just had a question from Michael in the chat, which asked, is, is 350 PSI high enough for a pressurization test? Absolutely. Um, actually, <clears throat> uh, 350 PSI G with a digital gauge, so you're watching very carefully, and even a burden tube gauge, if you're watching, taking a little bit more time, will tell you if you have a leak. Um, we also have to be careful about overpressurizing systems. I mean, even the ductless splits that are out there that are, are, are the install manual is recommending 600 PSIG. If you look on the nameplate of the equipment, typically if you're doing a new install, you're only pressurizing the low side of the, of the system, the line set and the low side of the system. And if you look at the recommendations stamped on the, on the system, it will not be above 350 PSIG. Uh, 600 PSIG may be good for line sets if they're quality copper line sets, but I would, I would, I would stay with 350 PSIG. Um, did that answer? And then there's a follow-on question about using the same pressure for multi-split systems, by which I think um, we're talking about multi-zone systems with okay. Okay. several um, refrigerant lines. Yes, when you, when you get into something like BRF and you get into something that, that is uh, um, multiple systems and large systems, then I would go with the manufacturer's recommendations. You're not gonna be pulling, you're not gonna be uh, doing a test uh, and watching it for 10 or 15 minutes. Some of those install manuals are recommending overnight testing, um, maybe even longer. And that's 600 PSIG. And for that, I would definitely go with the manufacturer's recommendations. I'm only talking about a simple install when you're, when you're uh, um, just trying to get the low side test done with the line set. Are we all set? Yeah, there are more questions about that, but I think we should get back to that in the Q&A. Okay, sounds good. Okay, next slide, please. So, so let's talk about what we can do to, to make leak type installations and keep that refrigerant in the pipe where it belongs. Next slide. These are some of the tools that we're gonna be using to making our, our piping connections clean and tight. We're going to use an eye log. We're going to use a good flare wrench, a flare uh, tool. We're going to use a cutting tool that has a sharp, uh, um, sharp, it's very sharp and not dented or, or digged on the wheel. We're going to use uh, a torque wrench. And the one I recommend actually is the one you see in the bottom right of the uh, slide here. The torque wrench, um, there are a lot of new torque wrenches out. Some of them are coming out digital. Some of them are coming out adjustable. I prefer the older school torque wrench because some of the adjustable uh, torque wrenches are just a little too large to get into some of the small places that we need to get to with that torque wrench. And, and I don't want to uh, dissuade anybody from using a torque wrench because they can't get onto the, to the uh, flare nut. Um, next slide, please. 
to make a leak type flare. Um, it is really an art. It's not that easy. Uh, it takes some time and it takes some care. Uh, you want to keep your cutting wheel sharp. You want to cut the co copper very slowly. You don't want to try to cut it too fast. You don't want to uh, bend the ends in because then you have more to ream afterwards. Take your time with a sharp wheel. Check the tube for any imperfections right away. Um, and ream the tube. And I would suggest using a round reamer rather than a pen reamer. A pen reamer is you're much more prone to uh, take a hunk of copper out to make a ding in the copper. The round reamer is much more even and, and uh, does a better job in my opinion. I also would try to, if you can, uh, to extend that tube downward while you're making that ream because you, we don't want any of that carbon flaking going or carbon uh, slag going into the, into the uh, tube and eventually ending up in some, something like an electronic expansion valve uh, where it can do a lot of damage. There have been times in the past where if I thought something went and I couldn't have a tube ending down and I thought something was going to go into the tube, I would actually take a little bit of nitrogen from another side and I would push it into that area where I was flaring. And actually, if you just hold it with your hand, a little bit, little bit of pressure built up and just pop it, pop your hand away, you can get a lot of pressure and anything that's in there will come flying out. And I've had success with that. And I've seen things come out of tubes that I've tried my darndest not to get to slag in, but did anyway. Um, you wanna make sure that the flare nut, the flare fitting that you're going on doesn't have any imperfections. Actually put the flare onto the fitting and look at the mating. Make sure that you're covering a good side, a good piece of that uh, uh, flare to uh, <clears throat> flare fitting. You want to put a small amount of lubricant on the uh, on the flare fitting and on the flare. Then I suggest getting that flare nut just beyond finger tight, um, and before you go with your uh, um, your torque wrench. Finish with a torque wrench and set it to whatever the install manual is asking for. And then we test the flare when under the test pressure with a good quality leak silt like Big Blue. That's a great silt. You need something that's really going to hang on to there um, and, and make sure that you have something you can see when it bubbles. Sometimes, some of these soaps, too, will operate in very low temperatures. Uh, they have a very low freezing point, so you can use them on a rooftop um when you're putting a, a system together next slide please so let's talk about brazing and silver silver soldering procedures next slide so making the, the decision to braze or solder um i've got to say I, i've installed many 410a systems with brazing and silver soldering both with great success. Uh, if you're working on a new install, it's going to be your choice whether you want to use silver solder or if you want to use brazing. Um, brazing is great. Silver soldering is just as good in my opinion. And as it's at a lower temperature. So if I'm near something that's um, that I need to be careful of, if I'm near a valve that has electrical wires around it, some of these ductless splits when they were manufactured, they had plenty of room around that reversing valve to braze it in. But if you're going to replace that reversing valve in the field, now all of a sudden you're in a cramped area. So you don't really want to put a lot of heat sometimes in those areas. I've had uh, contractors um, replace reversing valves with stay bright eight and just a little bit of flux. And it works very good, very well. I've had great success with that. Um, the disadvantage would be that you have to use a little bit of flux. You're using it very sparingly, and most of that flux is burned out in the process. So you're not, I have never seen an adverse effect of flux uh, in a system that I use 410A on. Next slide, please. So let's talk about leak testing procedures. Um, 
We talked about the digital gauge and it's much easier to find monitor a standing leak test with the nitrogen press uh, pressure with the digital manifold. It reacts so quickly within less than a tenth of a pound of a leak. Um, typical leak check time with a standard ductless system should take no more than 15 to 30 minutes compared to an hour or longer with a, with a burden tube manifold. Um, so that makes the digital manifold uh, the investment and immediate payback in time. Um, I would also use a first time lower pressure test of about 50 PSIG, just to check for something obvious, uh, a flare nut you forgot to tighten, uh, uh, a fitting that you forgot to braise or solder. It happens all the time. Nitrogen is not expensive, but the time involved to keep it in supply is. So I wouldn't be going to 200 PSIG. 50 PSIG will give you a good sanity check on some of your fittings or any of your fittings. And then I would pressure it up to, to my test pressure. So efficiency from our pressure recommendations are 350 PSIG, depending on the manufacturer's recommendations and the job type. Um, and again, you're gonna check all of your, your connections with bubble soap. If you have a hard to find leak, especially in a system that has been operating, uh, you can actually put a trace amount of refrigerant in with your nitrogen so that you can use an electronic leak detector. Now, um, you're gonna have to put the refrigerant in first, and then you're gonna put the nitrogen in behind it and let it settle out for 10 to 15 minutes because it takes a while for that refrigerant to circulate through the system. And then you can use your electronic uh, leak detector. So another way to, if, if you're having a real hard time finding a leak, you think it's in the condenser, a way to find that leak, if you have uh, a uh, nitrogen with refrigerant in it, or if you have a, a standing system that is fully charged, that has refrigerant in it, is to take that condenser and isolate it. And by that, I mean, put a tarp over it, put a, a blanket over it so that you can reduce airflow around it set that electronic leak detector underneath where the compressed near the compressor and just let it set. If there's a leak in any, anywhere in that condenser, within a short amount of time, you're gonna have that leak, uh, electronic leak detector going off because that refrigerant is heavier than air. It wants to settle to the bottom and it will. And if you cut down the airflow around it, uh, it'll happen. Um, it, it sometimes can take a little bit longer than that but at least it can tell you whether you have a leak in that area and then you can start going further to further investigate. Same thing with the evaporator. The refrigerant in the evaporator is heavier than air too, and it wants to settle down. It'll settle down into a condensate pan. Actually, you can stick a uh, electronic leak detector into a drain, drain line uh, tube and what will happen eventually is you can get a hit on that. That at least tells you you're in the right area. So, so that the work of opening that uh, evaporator up and checking it further uh, is warranted. And Gary, just while we're on the leak um, detection equipment, I'd also like to throw in that, you know, as part of Efficiency Vermont's uh, leak repair program, we do, um, we have been working with uh, Bacharach uh, and their newest mobile wand leak detector. And that's now detecting um, refrigerant leaks down to the one to two parts per million level. Absolutely. And it's giving you a digital readout right away. And I've been on leak detecting sites where, you know, a walk-in cooler and the door is closed and we'll see a spike in refrigerant with the door closed and you open the door and then the quant quantity will go up by 10x. And that's, so they're highly sensitive and there's some really great pieces of uh, electronic refrigerant detection equipment out there now. Oh, absolutely. I, I've seen uh, videos on that. I haven't experienced it myself, but just walking into the store, they can tell if there's a leak in it. And yeah. it's just incredible uh, some of the new tools that are out there that we're going to be moving to as we go go along. Next slide, please. So let's talk about uh, vacuum testing for a leak free and dry system a little bit. 
Uh, we know that proper evacuation of an air conditioning and refrigeration system is critical to the operation of that system. Uh, we know it more now than ever because, and we need it more now than ever because of the new oils. Polyester oil is extremely hygroscopic and it's very difficult to get moisture out of it once moisture has gotten into it. Um, really the only way you can get the moisture out of it without hours of a deep vacuum, and even then it's questionable, is to use a filter dryer. And we're not going to be using a filter dryer on a ductless split system, but uh, on a conventional system that really is, of course, uh, a prerequisite for closing any system that you don't, you've opened is to put a filter dryer in it. Uh, back in the day with R22, we didn't have to worry so much about uh, the hygroscopic uh, mineral oil because it, it wasn't, it was, it was much easier to work with than the polyester oils. So Efficiency Vermont has established an evacuation micron level of between 250 to 300 microns on your pull down not to rise above 500 microns when isolated for 10 minutes. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, we were at, in the day when we first started doing, working with uh, vacuum pumps, we would go to 700 microns. This was early days, in the early days of R22 and mineral oil. Today, we really need to go down to 250 to 300. Um, a good evacuation rig like like the blue holes, true blue hoses, and a good vacuum pump you see in, in pictorials here, um, that will save you countless hours of time and eliminating frustration. <clears throat> now, I want to mention something about those core removal tools. Uh, the really good ones that I would recommend would be something like an Appian tool. And they're really made for <clears throat> leak testing as much as evacuating. They're really tough tools. But during the evacuation process, it's really important to exercise those valves because what happens is um, moisture and air can get inside around the, the turn of the ball valve. So what I, what I recommend during the evacuation process is every once in a while just going over and, and turning those valves, and closing and opening that valve quickly. Um, this can this can really because when you finish your evacuation, especially, and you're looking at your decay test, if you operated that valve, you might see it jump up a little bit because there's 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 vapor there. So it's important to keep exercising those valves while we're doing our evacuation. Um, so you upgrading to the three quarter inch tool of hoses. These are non-permeable hoses. These are really made for evacuation and they can cut your evacuation time from hours to minutes. Um, if you're still using quarter inch hoses for evacuation, it can take you hours compared to minutes. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the new apps that are out there. Now, some of these apps you can, you can use in standalone tools that aren't that expensive, and they're not that uh, uh, hard to learn. Measure Quick is another app, is an app that really takes advantage of all of them. We're gonna talk about Measure Quick in a minute. That's a game changer in the industry. It's a third party software program that works with many, many different manufacturers to uh, give you indications of what's going on in your system. And it'll even tell you how to fix it. I mean. It's really, it's not always right, but it gives you, it points you in the right direction. Um, automated testing is something that's, that's coming up. Next slide, please. Uh, Fieldpiece is a great manufacturer. They have a, a free app called JobLink. And the JobLink app is fantastic. It's free, you, you use it with their tools and it can cut down, you know, it can give, really give you an indication quickly of what's going on with your system. And you see the, uh, the tools in the center here, you see the, the pressure uh, tools that you can use even without using a uh, digital manifold. If you just want to, and this is what we call non-invasive uh, service. Non-invasive service would take a sensor like that. You could hook it onto your uh, valves, your, your uh, 
especially in conventional, but even, even more so on ductless splits because the charge is so critical. We don't always want to put a manifold set on a system. That's the first thing we always did in the past. It should be the last thing we're thinking about today because what happens when you, when you put a manifold uh, set on there, you're going to lose refrigerant and you're going to, you, can, you can contaminate the refrigerant with just that manifold set. Next slide, please. Um, Richie Yellow Jacket has been a manufacturer, has been around for a long time. I own one of these Manitou uh, systems. I've used it for years and it's fantastic. I have uh, documents on my systems that I have here in my home that go back years and I can, uh, and I can watch my, the system operation over years and how it changes and I can check a lot of things with these Manitou apps. Uh, and it's not a really expensive app. Uh, and it is very powerful. It can really, especially with the micron gauge, everything is together on one app. Next slide, please. So then the question comes, if, if we're gonna step into, um, whoops, we're gonna step into some of the, the latest technology, what's it gonna cost us, you know? Um, is it going to be out of reach? But let's take a look at the cost of some of these, uh, these tools. The Field Feast uh, Professional Job Link Kit, which will give you just about everything you need with, uh, with their free app, is about $810. So they aren't inexpensive, but you have to slowly work your way up to something like this. And I think you're going to see that it's going to be worthwhile. The investment is going to be very worthwhile. The S-Man Digital Manifold from Fieldpiece is fantastic. If you're looking for a digital manifold, less than $500. Uh, the Digital Recovery Machines from Fieldpiece, the MR45, $870. That's not really out, much out of line to a standard uh, recovery machine that we've been, we've been buying for years. This is a digital machine, very quick, a very fast machine. Um, back in, in the 80s, when we, when we first learned that, that we had a problem with the ozone layer, I can't tell you how many, there were hundreds of manufacturers coming out with different recovery machines. And most of them were refrigeration systems, tiny refrigeration systems themselves. So they had all the disadvantages of refrigeration systems. Today, we're lucky to have the oil list compressors in all of these, uh, these new machines. Uh, the Measure Quick app um, is free. The first, to open it up, it costs you about $75 a year. It's not an expensive app to maintain and it's well worth it. I would check Measure Quick out. Uh, the Field Piece VP85 and True Blue Professional Evacuation Kit, that's a little pricey, but that's something that you, if you have, you can cut your evacuation time down to minutes on just about anything you're working on. So if you want to include the hoses, core removal tools, and other items you would be investing, we were talking about $5,000. Uh, some of these tools can be shared between technicians, <clears throat> but most of them you would want to outfit each, each technician with so that they had everything at their disposal when they got to a job. Next slide, please. So let's talk about a little bit about service procedures and best practices. Talk more about it. Um, so we're talking about non-invasive testing here. We're talking about checking the charge without gauges. It's the balancing act. There are trade-offs. Um, what we use to check the system with the manifold, what we, when we use it for a manifold, but we also lose refrigerant. We risk contaminating the system with moisture and air, and we risk leaving a leak at a Schrader core because they have a life expectancy. Um, if we walk up to a system, uh, say a conventional system, uh, one way is to use, next slide, please. Um, let's, let's go to the uh, next slide, I'm sorry. Next slide again, okay. So I would recommend using a refrigeration manifold set only when necessary. Sometimes it is. 
But your best initial diagnosis tools are your hands, eyes, and your ears. You look for dirt buildup, spot oil, because where refrigerant is leaking, you're going to find dirt is, is in the area. Pressure and refrigerant and dirt will mix, and you're going to find an oil spot. Listen for abnormal sounds. All these things you can do without putting a manifold on the system. Feel the lines in the condenser discharge air when approaching the condenser, just a sanity check. It's not gonna to be totally accurate. But if you walk up to a system and it's a hot summer day and you put your hand over the condenser fan and there's no heat coming out of there, you automatically know that you're in trouble. You can take a, a temperature reading on that liquid line and for, to be sure, when you have um, a system that's operating, your liquid line, because we're trying to reject heat into the ambient air, your liquid line is going to have to be warmer than the ambient air. If it isn't, then you have some kind of a restriction. So if, you're, if your liquid line is warmer than the ambient air, that's a good indication that we're, we're in refrigeration mode. So look at all the other things that could be causing trouble. Um, so let's go back one slide, please, and look at uh, system recovery and evacuation again. These are the latest procedures. These are the, the latest tools. Here is the, um, we always recommend putting a dryer on a um, recovery machine to protect the recovery machine. You're not going to really, you are going to clean out your refrigerant a little bit too. And as you put it back into the uh, recovery tank, if you're going to reuse that refrigerant, it's always a good idea to add a dryer. Most of these recovery machines, even the newest and latest and greatest, do not have a dryer on them. Uh, so we're going to want to have a dryer in line going into that machine. We're going to, we're going to want to have to have a good, we're going to have a good scale so we can measure the, the weight of that tank. Because the weight of that tank is very important. The weight of that tank is going to tell you when you're full. Um, and how do we how do we tell when we have a recovery tank that needs it is full? We need to stop putting refrigerant in it. Um, we monitor the weight tape, the weight of the tank at all times. We note the tear weight, which is listed on the tank, of, and we also look at whether it's a thirty or a fifty pound tank. We can hold eighty percent of the capacity of that thirty or fifty pound tank plus the tear weight. We don't want to go over that number, whatever it may be. Also, when we, when we get a recovery tank, if it's a fresh tank and doesn't, doesn't, not something that we've been using, we want to make sure that we evacuate that tank. And it, it's also a good sanity check before you start an evacuation on your vacuum pump, because you should be able to get down to about 50 microns quickly uh, on, a, on a fresh tank. Some tanks will come evacuated, um, but you can't always be sure of that. And uh, Ethan, that concludes my presentation. Great. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for that amazing amount of knowledge that you just uh, laid on us. I really appreciate that. You're very welcome. And, you know, just to wrap it up, um, from the Efficiency Vermont side of things, you know, what are the conclusions here? We know that refrigeration is a critical component to our society. Um, in the right tools and the techniques are critical to make sure that we're keeping um, our refrigeration systems in Vermont as leak tight as possible. And that Efficiency Vermont's really here to be a resource. Uh, we are moving more and more into this refrigerant management space and uh, really want to be viewed as having a pragmatic approach towards this. And so, um, we really welcome people's thoughts and opinions on that. And with that, I'd like to open it up to discussions and questions if that works for everybody. So um, Gary, there was um, a question about uh, which electronic leak detector do you recommend? Um, I think Ethan addressed that, but do you yeah. have any thoughts about a good um, leak detector? 
Uh, the background has the one that Ethan was talking about is a fairly expensive system that I see. Is, is well worth the money. But Backrack has several uh, lesser expensive units that follow in those same lines that are, are excellent, some of the best in the industry. So I would go to Backrack. I don't have a model number in front of me, but Backrack has, has uh, leak detectors that are reasonable in price and darn good, efficient. Yeah. Oh. So Luke, um, Luke had a, a question for the all the attendees. Um, and Gary, maybe also you have um, some thoughts about this. Um, what to do with the used vacuum pump oil? Um, that's going to be treated just like uh, any any waste oil. It's going to have to be taken to a, a location that will take waste oil. Great. And I think it might be worth bringing up, uh, Dana made the comment that not all of these mentioned specifications are consistent with engineering installation guidelines provided by manufacturers and incorporated into the manuals and training. Nylog is not recommended. 600 PSI as a test press for at least an hour is recommended. And before you jump on and enter your opinions, Gary, I just want to mention that as we talked about in this presentation, you know, we understand that manufacturers have to make recommendations based on a very wide geographic um, rent, uh, range and also a very wide tool range for their con select group of contractors. And what's critical in any of these recommendations that we're talking about is the right tools to be used. Mm -hmm. So if you're using an old pressure, uh, you know, a mechanical pressure gauge and you've got a visualization of plus or minus 10 PSI, and then you move to a, a digital pressure gauge where you have a um, specification of plus or minus 0.1 PSIG, what efficiency from Mont's perspective is, is if you have the proper tools in place, uh, the question is, what's the need to necessarily go up to that 600 PSI and test for an hour if um, your tools just increased visibility on your system by a thousand percent? Couldn't have said it better. Couldn't have said it better. I, exactly. My feeling. Uh, there's a question from Lewis uh, mm -hmm. about calibration of... Uh, the tools and the gauges. Uh, the tools aren't infallible. Uh, they've, they've had, they do have problems from time to time. The manufacturers are excellent um, as, as far as uh, troubleshooting and taking care of, of the customer. I would, if I would first go to a, a supply house, a local supply house uh, for my tools, but if I couldn't find them there, I would go to um, uh, True Tech Tools, and they um, they have all the tools I'm talking about in stock, and they also have a lot of educational material that's available with their tools. And they recalibrate the tools on a regular basis. They do need to be recalibrated, but uh, not once a year. Even even extended times on some of those tools, uh, like my Mantooth, I've never had calibrated. I've had it for six or eight, almost eight years, and it's working perfectly still. Awesome. Gary, one thing that, one question that I, I have, and I'm curious on your opinion on this, is uh, triple evacuation procedures for mm -hmm. new installations, and really curious on, on the view of the value of that for new systems. Sounds like there's probably value with servicing on the service side, but do you see value on new installations or not? I don't see. I see it as a, as a time waster on a new a new installation. I would not do a triple evacuation unless I had a feeling that I had a service problem. I had maybe water in the system that I was aware of, or a a real a bad burnout. I would probably try a triple evacuation to help. Triple evacuation um, is, I know, recommended in certain instances. Um, but one of the reasons, and you know, really what happens with a triple, triple evacuation 
is it, it seems to be working work better, but what it's doing is that nitrogen is cleaning up the sensor in your micron gauge on those on those triple evacuations, and um, it really doesn't give any benefit. You aren't going to pick up moisture by standing nitrogen in a system. Uh, it, it's simply not going to moisture is not going to go into the nitrogen and then easily come out. I would much rather see a sweep uh, of uh, nitrogen through a system to get uh, moisture out. That makes sense. And that's really focusing on, so tri triple evacs are kind of when you've got co coalesced moisture or yeah. in your yeah. system. But if, you've just, yeah, but if you've just got adhesion or something on your standard pipes, the standard evacuation should take care of that. That should take care of that, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the end result is your micron level. And if you're going down to 200 to 350 microns, you're not rising above 500 in 10 minutes, you're done. I mean, you, it's, it's almost, um, it's just too much work. It's more work than needs to be done. Great. And Dana had a, another perspective on this, which is uh, sometimes slur fittings will not fail unless a high pressure for more than half an hour. You want components to fail at a pressure above what they will normally see during operation. 350 PSI is not high enough. If you are in the final stage of a vac and you are at 250 and allow a small a rise in a short period of time, you are likely verifying and allowing a slow leak. No change in low vac should be seen as should be seen for a sustained period. Anyone not completing a triple evacuation is not installing in compliance with manufacturer guidelines. Very helpful information, Dana. Um, you know, we, sorry for that. No, I, I mean, I definitely hear what you're saying. And I think that's definitely, you know, there's varying perspectives here. Right, um, well, let's talk about flare notes a little bit. Um, in the early days of the ductless splits when they came into this, to the Northeast early when they came into the Northeast, I was selling them and I was selling line sets also. The line sets were sold initially with the flare nuts on them. Um, which was uh, a savings in time for the, for the technician. But we didn't realize at the time that those flare nuts were not proper, proper flare nuts for heat pump operation. They weren't standing up to the hot and the cold um, that the heat pump was gonna give it. They were plumbing uh, flare nuts. The flare nuts that should be used on the unit are the flare nuts that are shipped with the unit. And what was happening was in the early days, contractors were taking the flare nuts off the units and throwing them out or, or, or keeping them and using the flare nut that was on the line set. Today, you'll see that well, line sets come without flare nuts. And that's the reason. The initial, the early flare nuts were not up to, to spunk to take care of that, that extreme heat and cold. Um, but the new ones are, especially the, the, all the ones that come with the units. And you'll, you'll notice a price difference. I mean, a standard flare nut can cost you less than a dollar, but one that's made for heat pumps is gonna cost you eight or $10. So we have a few questions coming through on the other channel here. Um, uh, let's see, how good is the technology for predicting low refrigerant charge by monitoring electricity use? Mm. Um. I can take that one because I've okay. seen those electrical profiles. Mm -hmm. um, so how good the tech for it right now um, is a good question. What I've, we've done a lot at Efficiency Vermont of a lot of detailed high frequency um, power monitoring on refrigeration systems specifically. And what we've found is you definitely can tell if there is a leakage um, occurring and you can actually tell pretty quickly. And the variables that you're looking for are uh, compressor duty cycle and compressor power over a sustained period of time. What we've seen is that when we hit a refrigerant leakage level, so that if you've got a receiver in your system that that's not able to kind of work as your buffer, um, once you leak enough refrigerant so that buffer tank isn't really helping, we're seeing a consistent doubling in compressor runtime in between each duty cycle. And then compressor power actually falls. 
So as you lose refrigerant, um, you've got less work that can happen on your compressor. So you do see compressor power fall and duty cycle rise. If you're monitoring other components, you'll also see some interesting um, variables happen, especially discharge temperatures are gonna start rising as well, post compressor. And Gary, um, are some of the apps that you talked about, are they able to um, interpret electrical readings and indicate a potential problem with refrigerant charge? Yes, on um, some of the apps, especially the job link app uh, from Fieldpiece, uh, includes uh, electrical readings uh, and actually it was Bluetooth from your your electrical meter that goes right into the app the information does others you would you would simply have to take the readings and then enter them into the app uh, Wayne has a question on uh, what's the procedure for using a single hose evacuation how do we add refrigerant um, with that setup um, you're going to be using the single holes for evacuation, and then you're going to have an opportunity to open or close that hose on that with that core remover tool. And hopefully, it's one made by somebody like Appian that's really strong and sturdy. Those are made for charging as well as they're made for, for evacuation. You can hook a manifold set or holes up to that uh, core removal tool before you take that core out for your charging. That's not a problem. So again, the right tool makes it happen. Right tool. Um, so Ethan, there's a question about um, efficiency from on sentence for um, leak testing equipment. Did you want to mention the um, the leak testing EEN group? Um, I'm not sure if you saw uh, Bryn's message from this morning. I did. Um, I so yeah, we. Efficiency Vermont does have a leak um, refrigerant leak testing program um, specifically tailored to small and medium businesses around the state. Um, there's definitely a conversation that could occur um, between Efficiency Vermont and any contracting group that's interested in kind of enrolling in that refrigerant leak detection um, EEN trade ally group. So I think the best step for that is if there's interest uh, to reach out to uh, myself, Leeling, and Bryn, and um, my contact information is here, and I can pass uh, any interest along to our efficiency excellence manager or network manager, and um, we can continue that conversation. Andrew, we'll reach out to you directly, and anybody else that um, wants us to uh, reach out to them after the session, um, put it in the chat. Any other questions? We, we have some questions for you, so uh, don't jump off right away if we have a few seconds of dead air here. So my most burning question for you all, um, first of all, I, I really wanna thank you for attending. Um, and I'm wondering what is next for this topic. So I would like to know if folks would be interested in a training session on using the new apps and the um, sort of integrated toolkit to do service troubleshooting. Um, Gary just introduced it a little bit here, but I think there's a lot to go into, particularly with an eye toward not breaking open the refrigerant system in order to do a test. If you can figure out what's wrong with the system and you can repair it without measuring the refrigerant charge, then that will contribute to the effort to keep it in the pipe. So would people be interested in attending a session like that? I'm guessing it would be longer than this session. Maybe it would be two hours. And then also to go with that question, um, what time of day do you prefer to um, have trainings like this? And if you just wanna put your thoughts in the chat, just shout it out, what works for you? Do you prefer it to be at the end of your workday? So maybe 3.30? Do you prefer it to be before you hit the job site? So maybe seven or 7.30, um, is lunchtime good? Uh, would you rather just take the day off and just do trainings and make it not an on-site day? So any thoughts you have about further trainings you want, you'd like to see or what works best for you in terms of timing? We'll, we'll take it.
And of course, any other questions for our presenters? Okay, it looks like we're drying up on uh, on questions here. Um, so, uh, Gary and Ethan, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Ethan, I'm just going to hand it over to you for um, last thoughts on our on efficiency Vermont programs and um, anything else you want to say about keeping in the pipe. Great. Well, thanks, Elaine. I mean, I think we've we've already talked about it. Uh, yeah, I, please let us know if there's interest in this. Um, we are record. Um, we are recording this webinar, so it will be available um, after this presentation. I don't know specifically when, but uh, we'll get that out to the group. And um, know that this is an area of continuing and increasing focus for Efficiency Vermont in our state. So refrigerant management is going to continue to be a part, um, and we are going to be focusing and trying to um, bring more of these learnings and trainings out there. So thank you all so much for your time. Um, we'll stop my share and we can, uh, we can wrap it up. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye everybody.